Speaking of fiat money world catastrophes, Graham, I couldn't help but notice this story that oh. the Ukraine may freeze the bank accounts to force people to fight this war. Yeah, this is, I'm going to bring that up in a, uh, I'm going to bring that up because this is really, uh, it's, Oh, I see you had a, something else up there. Well, we can, we can talk about that in a second, okay. but we, uh, all well, right, just had that up a second ago. So the Ukraine is here it is. Um, and let's put that on the screen there. You see, so Ukraine may freeze bank accounts to push war service. And then the question is asked is, is crypto the answer? And I, I put on Twitter, uh, I said on Twitter, like, yeah, this is why I like Bitcoin. Bitcoin, with, with Bitcoin, none of us have to go fight some insane war that's just benefits rich, rich people. Yeah, Bitcoin demonetizes war and violence. And what I mean by that is because it's unconfiscatable, it's uncoercible. Right, you cannot coerce someone into giving you their property, their Bitcoin, because it's behind this encrypted wall that you cannot penetrate. Even if you are the U.S. military, even if you are um, show up with a tank, you cannot get through this mil this encrypted wall of Bitcoin to seize anybody's Bitcoin. And so it changes the dynamic because economics has always evolved really over the course of human history as a byproduct of war and, and vice versa. There's always been this need for more territory. We're gonna expand, we're gonna take that guy's stuff. And, uh, but if you can't take that guy's stuff and you can't go to war and there's no profit incentive to go to war because the booty is unconfiscatable, then you're not gonna go to war. You know, you have to come up with some other reason incentivize you to get up in the morning other than to go and steal somebody else's shit. And so it disincentivizes war and it monetizes peace and love because then what people will come out with and do is in order to get some Bitcoin, they'll exchange something that would be considered a value uh, and that something would be useful like uh, food or some practical device or a homemade tool or you know, to put it in crude terms. And so it just changes the whole social contract and the social structure if you have perfect money, unconfiscatable money. So let me ask you this. The the liberal side of the political mm -hmm. aisle, I believe they're against war. Yes. Right? They're like tra traditionally like we're against war. It's usually on the right. They're like, hey, we got to go to war. Uh, we're war. We, we, we're the defense military industrial complex. We like war. We're on the right. We're conservatives. <clears throat> and the lefties, the perception anyway, is that they're against war. You know, they're against, they're more um, into the others. But, but so... The question becomes, what, why wouldn't liberals and lefties like Bitcoin for this reason? That's a, that's a question, Graham. Oh my God, Max! This is this this is the like main frustration I have as a lefty because I tell people, and I, to, to, to back up, I think this is why we have this problem. Why? Because America were fed this red team, blue team. So whenever the the team you don't like says they're in favor of something, the other team just says, "I don't like it." So. If, like, for instance, if Joe Biden were to say, I love Bitcoin, Republicans would be like, Bitcoin's awful. It's bad for America and vice versa. So, and this is the thing I, I tried and I even got some pushback from some lefties that follow me on Twitter after I posted this. They're like, why are you pushing this Bitcoin thing? And I said, they, first of all, when they say that, they don't understand what it is. The central banks, one of the reasons I'm a Bitcoiner, the central banks love war. They profit from war. One of the biggest things you get out of a war is debt. Because usually both sides have to keep borrowing money to keep the war going. And the banks, banks, banks are like bookies. They just want everybody betting on both teams. They don't care. No. <laughs> and, and this is the thing. If, if a government can seize your bank account and say, you have to go fight some ridiculous war that only benefits rich people, that's where Bitcoin comes in. And, and I don't understand, and I, I really, left lefties that watch my channel that are watching this, this is why Bitcoin is anti-war. It's anti-central it's anti -central banks. I mean, most lefties and, and all over the place are in favor of like freedom of speech. Like Julian Assange was, is, is in prison because of the American empire, doesn't like that he called out their crimes. Well, let's talk about what the IMF did when he was staying in the Ecuadorian embassy the IMF, which is a, a 
the financial muscle of the American empire said, hey, Ecuador, we have a $500 million you know, loan stimulus we're going to give you, provided you give up Julian Assange. Well, guess who got gave up? And now he's in Belmarsh prison. So that's how the central banks flex their muscle and they make profit from war. And this is why every lefty should be a Bitcoiner because it's anti-war. And yep, yeah, and uh, so Ukraine is a good example, and the Canadian truckers, of course, that's a good example. But with Ukraine, this is something that had all of their um, wealth been put into Bitcoin, it would not have been seized, right? And uh, that's a very important element to keep in mind. And I think going forward, as the war, the world gets more involved in these wars, that people who might not want to go fight a war, and as you point out, the war is really for the benefit of the banks. They're not ideologically position to uh, philosophically, you know, one side is morally right, the other side is morally wrong. No, they're both on the side of the bankers, the bankers are the bookie, and you're just dying for bankers' stimulus checks, essentially, or print money printing. You're, that's the cause of all wars mm -hmm. today, is to just print more money. So if you have your wealth in Bitcoin, then you're putting a, a, a line in the sand, you know, you're, you're cutting the connection between war and money. Because you're separating war from the money from the state, which is a very key part of the Bitcoin story, is that you're separating the state from money. And the state typically has been in the money business now for 300 years or more, as we kind of came out of the Middle Ages and into the modern, modern uh, nation state era, it became really the modern central bank era. And this has uh, been the story now for 300 years. And the, uh, the state wants people to believe that only they can issue money and only they can recognize money and only they can define what money is. But money existed before the state. Money existed for 100,000 years before the relatively new invention of the nation state and the central bank. And money will exist after the nation state goes away because if Bitcoin is disintermediating or putting the nation state and the central bank out of business. So money existed before the nation state Bitcoin separates the state from money. Bitcoin kills the state, effectively. That's the three-step process. And I think that's the people in Ukraine and the Ukraine war. And this is all going on. Uh, and, if, you know, the Canadian truckers, another example of how Bitcoin played a role in that conflict. You know, the Canadian truckers were not great at actually storing their Bitcoin, et cetera. So it, what, it, it, there, it wasn't as, as uh, great as it could have been, had there been a little bit more knowledge in terms of how to handle Bitcoin, how to store Bitcoin, et cetera, and to go into it fully aware with the Bitcoin. They came into Bitcoin mid-battle, I would say, <laughs> kind of on the fly as things started to get un un unruly there. And But that's an important lesson going forward is that um, if, in fact, getting back to the activists out there, activists, again, typically you would equate activism with the left. You have environmental activism. You have mm -hmm. civil rights activism. You have different activist groups. Well, if these activist groups are all into Bitcoin, then their treasurer that they have to fund their activism is unconfiscatable. So that would be a huge benefit. Well, you great, you make up great points. And I want to propose a scenario. So just going off of the numbers right now, a third of America is against um, this Israel bombing of Palestine. Uh, liberal Democratic voters age 18 to 34, 70% of them are against America funding Israel bombing Palestine, right? So I want to propose to you young people, if you're anyone watching out there, imagine if we go the bank, especially if we go to central banking digital currency, which is central, it's not free like Bitcoin. So imagine all of you young people out there protesting and hey, hats off to you. They've been protesting. We want a ceasefire. This isn't right. What if the government said, oh, we're freezing your bank accounts. You all have to now go to the Middle East and fight this war. Would you want to do that? If you owned Bitcoin, you could say, I ain't fighting for you at all because they could and they would and they might do that. Definitely. You know, um, the thing about the global geopolitical conditions prevailing at the moment is that war is breaking out everywhere because of deglobalization mm -hmm. and de-dollarization. So during the period of dollarization and globalization, we can say that this was really post-World War II and then accelerated in the 80s 
during a period of deregulation when financialization became more dominant as a percentage of the overall economy, it went from being, let's say, 15% of the economy to being 60 or 70% of the economy, if you really would look deeply into how all these companies actually get their profit. So if you were to understand that the financialization of everything has gotten to this point, uh, then you would understand that you can effectively orchestrate a rug pull on the whole house, house of cards. Uh, it, it, all activists have a common cause and a common enemy. It started with Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street was an interesting protest because it went after the banks on Wall Street. And that was the first time, to my knowledge, where people, activists, were looking more at the root cause of their mm. the issues that they were taking exception with. You know, if we can cut off the funding, then that would be an effective campaign. And that's true, but in the story of Wall Street and the money printers, of course, they can just print an endless amount of money. And so it's impossible to really wage an effective campaign. But in the case of Bitcoin, when you're effectively orchestrating a rug pull on the system because all you're, you, are, um, you are defunding um, the central banks by putting capital into Bitcoin. So that that capital ends up going into this unconfiscatable perfect money Bitcoin. And the folks that are in the business of printing all that money eventually just melt down. They're, they're melting down anyway. Right. Uh, but this would this would accelerate the meltdown, which I think you need to do to, to, to right the ship, to get to a point where there's strong fundamental values upon which you can build a society. But right now, we don't have that base to build a society on because it's all being printed into oblivion. Anybody with anybody who has access to a printer will print an inf infinite amount. And so you have a dysfunctional society. And that's happening all over the world. So everyone around the world, every conflict has a common enemy, and that is the central banking cartel. And we all have a common solution, and that is Bitcoin. So we, we're all working on the same, the same mm -hmm. fight at this point. There's... It's the what well, I guess I used to I call it the global insurrection against banker occupation. So we're under we're all living under banker occupation, and the global insurrection is Bitcoin. That's that that's such a great way to put it, and I and I really I I, I want everyone to understand that ultimately that's the thing I love about Bitcoin. We're all on the same team with Bitcoin. We all see the problem. We all see the problem as the central banks. And yeah. how they're used and how the states use them to, to muscle us and to put us into servitude and all that stuff. And like it's such it's such a solution. And again, if you don't get it at first, it's all right. I did not get this at first. I literally did, I was like, I first heard about it 2018, 27, and I was like, what F man? Like, mm -hmm. come on, this mm -hmm. is whatever unicorn digital hacker money. I didn't know what this was. And the more you learn about something. Like the the more you start to understand it, and, and 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 it's funny. Around my friends and family, I'm probably the most knowledgeable about Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But here in this space, I'm the least knowledgeable, and that's a good thing. I want to be more knowledgeable. I want to learn. I've learned more about it just in being here, just in doing this show. Uh, and that's what you should want to do. And the more you understand it, the more you see how powerful it is. Yeah, it's like different than being, a, let's say, a stockbroker or a lawyer where the more you know, the better you're at doing the job, but the worse you feel about yourself, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, I want to be a, a more successful investment banker. I mean, I'm going to have to get into a higher level of committing massive fraud. Or I'm, I'm, I have to know more about how the legal system works so I can get the loopholes for the clients who are paying me the big bucks. So it's a down, it's an inward soul-crushing experience to succeed in the fiat money world. With Bitcoin, it's the opposite. The more you learn, you know, the actually the better you feel about yourself, and the better you feel about the prospects for others. It's a much more hopeful feeling that you get. Uh, and of course, here in El Salvador, where Bitcoin is legal tender, and it's really very common conversation point to talk about Bitcoin. You have a double whammy. You have a double impact because you have a, the whole country is like leaning in that direction as well. So you have that. You have that going. Uh, at, at the same time. But this is one of the great things about Bitcoin is that, you know, you, it's like being a kid again, you know, where you, you find out, you know, how, what can I build with this Lego set? You know, can I build a rocket? You know, can I fly to the moon? I don't know. Let's see. 